Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Vecchione. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I already love you guys. That's why I, um, that's not really the joke, ma'am. That's actually my true feelings. I uh, live in Queens. I have a, thank you. Thank you. There's some Queens people here. I have a, I look like a police officer. And uh, the best part of looking like a cop and not being a cop is when I catch teenagers smoking weed. I like that a lot. I enjoy it. As I take their weed, I let them off with a warning. I sell the weed, I take the money, I buy cocaine. Which is more of an adult drug. We gotta get it off the streets. We gotta get it off the streets from an enforcement. Thank you. I like this crowd because you guys seem to be about my age. Are there any millennials here? Millennials? Yes. Thank you so much, millennials, for being here. I know it takes a lot for you guys um, to pay attention. You're probably on... 12 different kinds of medications to make that happen. And I know you guys have tough jobs as gluten-free web designers and vegan Uber drivers, Bitcoin Venmo managers. You have to understand, when I got out of high school, there were five jobs that you could have. Five. Five jobs that you could have. There was a band called The Village People. Those were your job choices. I was an Indian chief from 1991 to 1995. That's true. I'm not just saying that for shits and giggles. I am 100% Italian. Thank you. Wow, that really plays well out here. Out here, that does good. I'm 100% Italian. No one usually cares at all. I thought it was gonna be a big deal when I was 10. Turns out no one gives a shit. The only time I tell people now is when I give blood. Cause they're like, what's your blood type? I'm like, it's funny you should ask. It's 100% Italian. They're like, that's not at all what we mean. I'm like, it's what I mean. Cause I want my blood to go to somebody eating, yelling, or holding a grudge for no reason. Cause that's what Italians are really good at. And gambling, and losing. There's no help for gamblers. It's all about the smokers with their gums and their patches and their hypnosis, right? There's one sign as you drive into Las Vegas that says gambling problem, please call this number. That's ineffective. You should at least say gambling problem, I bet you won't call this number. That would be more effective because these people have a gambling problem. I'm gonna take that cough as a laugh, sir. Okay, that counts. That counts as a laugh. <laughs> Diversity is the name of the game in show business right now. My manager calls me up. He's like, Mike, is there anything in your background that could give us some much needed diversity? And I'm like, well, I'm 100% Italian. Does that help? He's like, actually, that hurts us a lot. So if you could not mention that again, that would be a big help. He's like, what about what's going on inside of you? Is there any diversity there? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, with your feelings. Like sometimes do you feel like a woman that is trapped inside of a man's body because that's a story we could tell. I'm like, no, that's actually not happening right now. But I was born C-section. So I was a man who was trapped inside of a woman's body. And I did not want to leave that woman's body. I think that makes me a little bit of a feminist. But the male doctor cut my mother open and dragged me crying into the patriarchy. Thank you, I'm very brave and very courageous and brave. Guys, be good to these women, okay? They will get revenge if you're not good to them.
I read this article. The police in Florida found a severed penis on the side of the road with a condom on it. I'm like, wow, that guy was worried about the wrong things. Ladies, it's your time right now. It's your time. Female teachers are having sex with their male students. I read it in the papers. And it was probably happening when I was in school. And if I'm honest with myself, I was not good looking enough to have sex with my teachers. I had to have sex with who? The crossing guard. Exactly. I had consensual sex with the crossing guard. You can't have non-consensual sex with the crossing guard, guys. Because even if she says no and you don't hear it, she has a sign that says stop. Okay? Consensual sex is the name of the game right now, everybody. Consensual. That's the only way I'll do it, ladies. Consensual. But once you give me consent, I go full penetration. Full penetration, but consensual. Consensual, yet with full penetration. It's my two-pronged approach to intercourse. Last time I had sex, it was consensual, but also with full penetration. But it was a twist ending, okay? Because I was on top of her with full penetration. The woman had an Audi belly button. I have an innie. She was penetrating me back. Non-consensual. Non-consensual, ladies. Non-consensual. Hashtag me too. Hashtag me too. Thank you, I'm very brave. I actually used to teach kids with behavioral problems. I taught kids with behavioral problems, and now I do stand-up comedy. Which is easier, because even if you're not laughing, at least you're not biting me. My first job, I worked in a behavioral school. For kids who got kicked out of Philadelphia schools, they lived on campus. And my job was to work in the school. I'd sit in the hallway. If there was a problem in the classroom, I'd come in and restrain the kid. I was making $8.80 an hour. I know, big money. It's very weird when you have to restrain a student because you have to wrestle them to the ground, but they can still talk to you. I was taking this kid down one time. He turns to me. He says, my cousin is going to come up here and he's going to kill you. And this is a teaching moment, believe it or not. So I was like, look, if your cousin kills me, I also have a cousin who loves me very much. So if your cousin kills me, my cousin will then have to kill you. Yeah, that's not me. That's the streets. That's, that's Tupac. That's not me. Trying to teach him empathy. You know what he said to me? I'm ready to die. I'm like, me too. I'm also ready to die. I don't know why you're ready to die. I'm ready to die because I'm making $18,000 a year to have this conversation. You just ended up here. I went to college to get here. Who do you think made poorer life choices? I would say me. I would say you should be restraining me. Then I taught in a public school, and that's where the real money started rolling in. Thank you, that's the funniest thing I've said. The kids I taught, I don't know how many teachers are here. Teachers? Okay, you're my people. You guys know what I'm talking about. These kids that I taught, they do not have grades. They have goals, they have individualized educational plans. Right? And the administrators in the school don't even realize that. I'm teaching, I'm being observed. It's high stress situation. There's a kid sleeping in the back of the room. Principal pulls me aside. He's like, look, I usually don't stop the observation, but that kid shouldn't be sleeping. It's inappropriate. I'm like, actually, sir, it's not. Because he's not being graded. His goal, however, is to not throw his desk through the window. So actually, he's killing it right now, okay? He's doing an amazing job. You're the one who's being inappropriate. Please keep your voice down. Because if you wake him up, he will throw his desk through the window. But do 
Do you guys have kids? Yes, you said that with no energy or emotion. I think when I was growing up, and maybe it's the same because we're around the same age, you needed kids. You needed kids because you would drink and do drugs until you were about 30 or you were tired of it. And you were like, you know what? Let's have kids now. It's time to settle down and have kids. But now you don't need kids because there's the internet. And I'll be the one to say it. The internet is better than kids. I used to teach kids. All my friends have kids. I'm not impressed with kids. Buddy calls me up. He's like, Mike, you're never going to guess what just happened. My little boy just took his first steps. You know what I said? Who gives a shit? I'm like, do you know what's happening on the internet right now? There's a sea otter that's playing the piano. Your dumb kid is reaching natural milestones. This sea otter, I don't know his name. I call him Beethoven. He's amazing. He walks out of the sea, probably better than your kid could walk to a piano, bangs out a concert, does a victory lap, fights a penguin, goes back into the sea. Thank you. That joke is really about global warming, everybody. Let's remember to recycle. Let's remember to recycle tonight. Okay. I'm in my 40s. Some of you might be younger, so I'll tell you what it's like to be in your 40s. Whether I lift weights or get drunk, my body feels about the same. The next day, I'm just achy and sore, questioning all of my life choices. <laughs> my body is starting to break down. My spine is curving at what I would call an alarming rate. Every day, every week, every month, I'm closer and closer to sucking my own dick. When I was a boy, that was the dream. Remember, guys? But now that it's actually happening, it's a fucking nightmare. What I'm saying is I have bad posture. My posture is bad. If you were to look at an evolutionary chart, I look like the guy third from being a man. That's how bad my posture is. I'm eventually gonna knuckle drag my way back into the sea. Do you know that if you're a man in your 40s, your prostate grows every year? That's true. And that's not cool for me because I'm still trying to date. <laughs> Women are like, do you have a big dick? I'm like, not really, but I do have an enlarged prostate. <laughs> you will never die in a fire with me. I'm every seven to ten minutes urinating. <laughs> Bit by a jellyfish? I'm your guy. <laughs> Hashtag hero. Because I have no wife or child, and my prostate is growing every year, I've decided to raise it like a son. To compete with my friends, because my friends are really arrogant. They're like, my son's going to medical school. I'm like, my prostate will be there eventually also, if it continues to grow at this alarming rate. Last night, it's 2.30 in the AM. I'm in the bathroom, my huge, right? I see a bug. We see each other. I see him, he sees me, we both freeze. We've all been in this situation. But now I have to decide, does he live or die? And I'm siding towards letting him live because I'm Christian. But then I'm thinking to myself, he's going to procreate, and then I'll come back into the bathroom at 4 a.m., which I will because I have an enlarged prostate. And there's going to be five bugs there. And then 10, and then 15, and then I'm outnumbered by bugs. Number one, I'm a little jealous he could have a family in two hours, and it's taken me 40 plus years, and it still hasn't happened. That's part of it, yes, sure. But mostly, I don't want to be outnumbered by bugs. So I decide he has to die, but I'm not going to kill him with my hands. I'm not a savage. I reach for the closest thing in my bathroom, which is Axe Body Spray. Because while I'm not a savage, I am a douchebag. Because I use Axe Body Spray. I spray him down. I really give it to him. I hose him down hard. Guess what? He does not die. He runs away. Now I'm thinking, I'm screwed. He's definitely going to procreate now. Because no female can resist Axe Body Spray. I don't care if you're an insect in a bathroom or a woman at a comedy club. Axe Body Spray is amazing. Thank you. That joke was brought to you by Axe Body Spray. I live in Queens, and uh, 
My car was stolen. Anybody live in Queens? Yes, thank you. Have you seen my car? Because it was stolen. My car was stolen. Have you seen it? I go to my car, it's not there. I call 911. It took the police two hours to get to me. Two hours. They got there. I'm like, officer, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but in the time it took you to get here, I could have watched four episodes of the show Cops. That's a 30 minute show, everybody. The cops showed up on horses to a Grand Theft Auto. Nothing says fuck your emergency like cops on horses. So I wrote a Yelp review, like the millennials. Do you know that you can Yelp review your local police precinct? That's true, you can write a Yelp review like they're at Chili's. So I'm like, cops showed up on horses to my Grand Theft Auto, you guys really need to update your equipment. And I told the cop that, he's like, we put out an APB. I'm like, with what, pigeons? Because obviously you're using a Noah's Ark type system to get my car back. Then the cop was condescending to me, which doesn't make sense because I look like every cop in their precinct. He's like, who do you think stole your car? I'm like, I don't know, officer. Are we using the Socratic method of crime solving? Is this an acting exercise? Are you part of an improv team? My guess is somebody who does not have a car. Perhaps somebody who rides a horse. Yeah, I flipped it, reversed it, put it back on him. Law and order, SVU. Boom, boom. The worst part, everybody, my car was stolen in front of a really good Italian deli in Queens. So cops were showing up, but they were not showing up for my emergency. They were showing up for lunch. So I stopped one of them, like, hey, I called you like two hours ago, my car was stolen. He says, we're not street cops, we're counter-terrorism. I'm like, what's that mean? He's like, it means if you see something, say something. We are those cops. Now, when you went to go get your car, what did you see? I said my car was gone, so I saw nothing. He's like, you only call us if you see something. If you see something, then you say something. You saw nothing, so you need to shut the fuck up and keep it moving. Shut the fuck up and keep it moving. <laughs> so now when I go on the road to spread my talent, I have to take the mega bus. Do you guys know what that is? Mega bus? Okay, I'll explain it to you guys. Do you know what a greyhound is? Okay, uh, a greyhound is a limousine compared to a mega bus. A mega bus is a bus that's too big for the road, full of people who are too big for the bus. Mega bus. It's a double decker bus, two stories of white trash rolling down the street. Mega bus. It's a gigantic shit show. If you're like, hey, I want to take a bus, but still feel like I'm in a trailer park, Megabus is a good option for you. If you're like, hey, my IQ and credit score are both below 80, Megabus is a viable option for travel. If you're like, hey, I need to go to Baltimore, but I still kind of want to see a dog fight, Megabus. Megabus is the way to travel, everybody. If you're one of these people who's like, hey, there's too much regulation in this country. You've never been on a megabus. There is no regulation on a megabus. There was a gang member smoking a cigarette on the megabus. Secondhand smoke is a killer, everybody. You know what kills you faster? Confronting a gang member who's smoking a cigarette on the megabus. How did I know he was in a gang? He had a neck tattoo that said, ride or die, which is close to the megabus motto, which is ride and die, because it's a terrible bus. There's not even a bus station. They just pick you up on the street. <laughs> you ever go through TSA at the airport and you're like, I fucking hate the way they're searching me. You'd never have to worry about that on a mega bus. You can hand the guy a bomb. He will thank you and politely put it on the bus. 
and you get in, he closes the door, no announcements, you just take off. And you hope you're going to Baltimore, but you don't know for sure. There's no indication that you're going to Baltimore. It's anybody's game. I'm sitting on the mega bus, everybody. And I'm sitting in my seat, it's the middle seat between the woman who's coughing up blood and the man who's giving himself minor foot surgery. And I decide to move to the VIP section because there's no one sitting. Some of you are like, there's a VIP section to the mega bus? Get off your fucking high horse. Yes, there is. Let me also say this. If you time it right, you can buy a mega bus ticket for as low as one dollar. And they offer free Wi-Fi. But the Wi-Fi never works. People are outraged, like, how the fuck is there no Wi-Fi? And I'm like, because we paid one dollar for a bus ticket. I actually prefer that there's no Wi-Fi for one dollar. Maybe other shit on the bus works that we need more than Wi-Fi. Like the steering or the brakes. I think the bigger question for one dollar is how does Megabus pay the driver? Is there even a driver or are all of us expected to take turns driving the Megabus? I'm sitting in VIP, no Wi-Fi, and this is how VIP goes. It goes seat, seat, table, seat, seat. So you're just staring into the eyes of a stranger for five hours on the way to Baltimore. Now, I don't know the way that you guys are. Maybe you're more enlightened than I am. But I'm staring at somebody for four hours, five hours, and there's no Wi-Fi. I tend to judge them. I get very judgmental. The man in front of me was wearing sandals. Now, some people are probably going to disagree with me. I'm against men wearing sandals anywhere but the beach. It's too comfortable. Some people agree, some people disagree. My mother disagrees with me. She's like, you know who wore sandals all the time, Michael? A man by the name of Jesus Christ. And I was like, yeah, and they got him. You're actually making my point for me. Even the son of God with inappropriate footwear could not escape. I'm not a very good Catholic. Here's what I will do. If you sneeze in a series of sneezes, I will say God bless you all the way through. A lot of people don't do that. They say God bless you on the first one, then they act pissed that you're still sneezing. Not me. I'll be there for you. As a matter of fact, the more you sneeze, the more religious I get. God bless you. God loves you. Jesus walks with you. Holy Spirit watches over you. Lamb of God! I go right into a mass. I don't fuck around because I feel like that's where you need prayer. On your ninth sneeze because you have Zika. Zika, everybody. Terrible disease. Best stripper name ever. Is it not Zika Ebola Martinez? That was a fun weekend in Miami. I'm pro-Jesus. Thank you for your awkward silence. I think even if you're not Christian, you should be a fan of Jesus. I'm a fan. And the story that got me is when he cured the guy who had leprosy. I was like, Jesus is pretty solid. But would it have been better if he would have just cured leprosy? He cured one guy who had leprosy. You know? That must have created an awkward situation. Because that guy had to go back to his colony. They all lived in colonies. And he's like, guys, I got some great news. I found the one guy who could cure leprosy, and I no longer have leprosy. So if I could just get my stuff, I'm gonna head out. And the lepers were probably like, well, did you tell that guy who cured you? Did you tell him about us? And the guy who got cured was like, I did not even think twice about you guys. I gotta be honest with you. I was so thrilled not to have leprosy. You have no idea how this feels. And the lepers were pissed. They were probably like giving him the finger. They were like, fuck you, fuck. They probably took their middle fingers off and threw it at him. Which is one of the benefits of having leprosy. You guys are a great crowd. Sometimes comedy doesn't go that well for me. Yes, thank you, half the room.
sometimes comedy doesn't go that well for me. And my friends outside of comedy are like, Mike, how do you handle it? I'm like, I handle it fine now because I do meditation every day. 20 minutes, deep breath in, deep breath out. And I'll do it anywhere. I'll do it in front of you guys. I'll do it on a mega bus. <laughs> but I would not do it on this mega bus trip because the woman next to me was on oxygen. So I felt like if I did my deep breathing, it would look like I was just showing off. <laughs> Like, look how easy this is for me to breathe in and out. Oh, you need a machine? That sucks for you. The woman across some oxygen lady had an emotional support animal. Yes, it's a dog that's meant to calm your emotions. If I had an emotional support animal, I would have a pit bull. Yeah, because then I would feel safe. Everybody else would have a panic attack. She did not have a pit bull. She had a pug. And I was like, oh, you have a dog. She's like, I have a prescription. I'm allowed to have this. I'm like, I do not need to see your prescription to know that you have a lot of problems. I can tell by the way that you're screaming at me, a complete stranger, for making an observation. She pulls out the pug. Have you ever seen one? Okay, it looks like he got punched in the face 17 times. His eyes are bulging out of his head. Like he looks like he just saw something that he will remember for the rest of his natural life. And he's breathing like he's got 18 different kinds of asthma. I'm looking at this, I'm like, that's the fucking dog that makes you feel calm? That dog looks like he's having a nervous breakdown right now. But maybe that's the psychology. It's like, look, I'm fucked up. But at least I'm not this dog. This dog is a fucking mess. Two bad hips, but yet a full erection for the entire trip. Could you imagine? How are you going to find a mate with two bad hips and an erection? I'm sure there's an app for it. The most nerve-wracking part of taking the Megabus is when you leave New York, because you have to take the Lincoln Tunnel. And the Megabus is very big. The Lincoln Tunnel is very small. So it's nerve-wracking. It's like watching a black man have sex with an Asian woman. And I would never normally say that, except it was happening in the seat next to me. Megabus. We get to our destination, guys. And uh, I'm so relieved to be there, alive. The driver is asking for tips, because I do not believe they pay him a salary. So I tip him $10, which is 10 times what I paid for the Megabus ticket. And he's so appreciative. He's like, thank you so much. He's like, my last job, you know what I did? I drove a garbage truck. I looked him right in his face, and I'm like, it kind of still do. Okay. I don't have any more bus jokes. <laughs> Airplane jokes it is. <laughs> I flew to Vancouver a few weeks ago, and it's super cool when you fly to Vancouver because they do all the announcements in English in case of an emergency. Then they do all the announcements again in French in case of a sexier, slightly more arrogant emergency. <laughs> We're seat on the plane, guys. Where do you think it is? No, good guesses, but no. It's right behind first class. Because they used to put a drape to separate first class from the hobo section, where I sit. But now it's like a mesh curtain, so it's like, we don't want you up here, but we want you to be able to see what these people have. And they're playing a dangerous fucking game. Because I get angry, I start thinking to myself, if this plane ever landed on a deserted island, I would make the first class passengers my slaves. I'd flip the economic system of the plane on its head, I'd be like, you work for me now. And if there was no food, I would eat them. And I would start by eating their lower torso. And between each bite, I'd look them dead in their eyes and I'd be like, do you have enough leg room? How's your, how's your leg room? Shark attacks, are you guys afraid? Yes. They say to punch the shark in the face. They say if you're being attacked by a shark, you should punch the shark in the face. I'm not a marine biologist. But you know when something just sounds wrong? I feel like if the shark has your arm, the thing to do is to start thinking of yourself as a one-armed person. 
I feel like attitude of gratitude is best in that situation. Because I feel like if you punch the shark in the face in a couple of minutes, you're going to have no arms. That's really not the shark's fault. That's on you. That's you for being greedy. Let's look at it from the shark's perspective. You're a shark. You're eating a delicious arm. You're almost to the shoulder. You're like, fuck, I can't believe this is almost over. This was so tasty. And then, boom, another arm comes rhythmically into your snout. You're like, I hit the shark lottery. This is like the Little Caesars of people. Delicious. Two for one. Thank you, sir. Thank you for getting these jokes. Thank you for getting these jokes. I'm on a plane. I'm in the middle seat. I'm sitting next to an Asian person. Now, I love sitting next to Asians on planes. Why? Because they are travel-sized people. Exactly. <laughs> Small Asian woman wearing a surgical mask. Have you seen it? Am I crazy? I don't know what it means. But now I'm afraid to fall asleep because I feel like she might surgically remove my kidney, dress for the job you want, and sell it on the Asian eBay. I don't know what's happening on Asian eBay. I'm not Asian. Or maybe that's not the message she's trying to send. Maybe she's trying to send me another message, and that message is, I'm not going to suck your dick on this flight. Probably no, probably no happyending.com. I want her to take the mask down. I'm a little insulted she didn't bring two more masks, at least for the people in her row. But I'm not going to pull it down. I'm a gentleman. I figure I'll start a conversation. She'll have to respond. She'll take it down. I'm a genius. <laughs> Plus, I like to learn about people. So I'm like, ma'am, what do you think the problem is between North Korea and South Korea? She's like, I don't know. I'm Chinese. I'm like, answer the fucking question. Because China's a totalitarian government, and that's how they're talked to. So... I was being culturally sensitive. You're responding like I'm being racist, but I'm being culturally sensitive. You're gonna hate the next part of this joke. I'm in the middle seat, Asian woman. There's a child sitting next to me in the coveted window seat. The stewardess is being a bitch to me, but she's being super sweet to the child. But she has to talk over me to get to the child. So every time she talks to the child, I just pretend like she's talking to me. She's like, is there anything else I can get for you right now, sweetheart? I'm like, nope, I'm doing good, princess, but thank you for checking in. And I did that several times, and she didn't get the joke any of the times. So I got tired of her horseshit sense of humor. Hit the call button, she comes up, she's like, what? I'm like, I'm sorry to do this, this is kind of a weird situation, but uh, I'm a registered sex offender. The turbulence is causing me to have a lot of feelings. Boom, they move me to first class. It's just, just an FYI if you're a traveler, if you threaten to fuck a kid, you'll get an upgrade. Guys, I am not a registered sex offender, okay? Not in this state. I'm not registered in this state. I'm special ed certified, so when I moved to New York, I taught preschool. I taught preschool in New York. That's the perfect job to have if you smoke pot. Because you go in in the morning, immediately tell a story that never actually happened. It's called a fairy tale. Potheads tell them all the time. Then you have a snack. Then you take a nap. Then you go outside, play frisbee. Come back in, another snack. Then you go to look for your coat, you can't find it. You put it in the cubby, but it's not there now. Then you start crying. And then your mom picks you up. My parents are old now, and they live in Florida. And my friends are like, Mike, how old are they? And I'm like, I'm not gonna give you a number, but I will tell you that sometimes they fall down and they do not get back up. And I wanna get them life alert, but not the life alert that contacts the hospital. That's called the easy way out, the way I was raised. I'd like to get them a life alert, like if they fall, it just plays music from the movie Rocky. And then shouts encouraging phrases from the movie, like, get up, you bum! Because that's how I was raised, with a lot of tough love, encouraging phrases, but no actual help. I go to visit my parents, and they go to bed like at 9 o'clock. So I do what any of you guys would do in that situation. I get drunk, and I fuck around with the medical equipment that they use to keep themselves alive. 
They're sleeping. I'm shit faced. I go to my favorite machine that they have. It's the what? Blood pressure machine. Holy shit. It's like a casino if you're drunk. Because I take the band that goes around the arm, but because I'm hammered, I put it around my chest. I turn on the blood pressure machine. And do you know that if you do that and close your eyes, it feels like your father is hugging you? That's actually true. That's actually true. Then it gradually deflates like you're asking him for money. Because you're a stand-up comic in New York and things aren't going that well. My father passed away two years ago, but I still feel like he's here with me spiritually. But because he's not here with me physically anymore, the only people who call me son now are my black friends. <laughs> Happened the other day. I was like, what's up, Lamar? He's like, what's up, son? I'm like, Papa? <laughs> Papa, is that you? Your skin is so ashy, Papa. You're wearing your pants dangerously low, Papa. Black people are laughing, so whites, you may laugh. That's, that's how we do it. Black and white, we gotta come together, man. I do a lot of time thinking, because I care about white America. I also care about black America very deeply, you know? So, what's the answer? You know what I've come up with? Brunch. It combines what both groups love. What do white people love more than anything? Breakfast. The whites love breakfast. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Who do you think came up with that? I guarantee it was a fucking white. White people love breakfast. And what do black people love? Being two hours late for shit. Brunch. Brunch is perfect. I was the middle child. I was the victim of bad birth order. Bad birth order. I was the middle child. My parents have my brother, and they're like, I guess we're having kids, we have a boy, let's try for a girl. Then they had me, and they're like, let's try again. Then they had my sister, and they're like, we got it. Our boy and our girl. But now we have this extra kid that we don't really need to complete our family, but we can really take chances with him. We can really roll the dice, because my father had a gambling problem. We had a dog when I was growing up, and this dog, he would bite me occasionally. He was just moody, and he would bite me occasionally. Now, if a dog looks at a kid the wrong way, the dog is gone. This dog used to bite me occasionally. So I sat my parents down, and I'm like, hey, the dog is biting me. They're like, we understand that, but your brother and your sister really like the dog. He's part of our family now. We're going to keep him. I'm like, well, what's the plan? Are we going to keep him in a cage when I'm around? Are we going to retrain him? My parents were like, we do not have the money for that. Just be careful. So they started me on anti-anxiety medication. Because you tend to have anxiety when there's a wild beast in your home that attacks you occasionally. But it made me wet the bed, so I stopped taking it. I started tonguing it. I started feeding it to the dog under the table. Then he started having accidents, and then my parents got rid of him. And as he was being led away, our eyes met. He nodded to me as if to say, well played. He knew he had been beaten by a superior mammal. He knew it. I come from an Italian on both sides, mother and father. And I'll tell you something, I was raised with both parents. You know what I realized? Everybody's broken differently. I have friends, their fathers bailed, and they're broken in a different way. My father was there, too much. He was in my face, all the time. All the time, in my face. And that's, now I'm broken in like a different way. He would talk to me like I was an adult. When I was like 10, I want an allowance. I'm like, hey, how about you give me an allowance? All my friends are getting an allowance. He's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You get to live here for free. Then he got pissed at me. He's like, what do you think, we're running a hotel here? You think me and your mother are running a fucking hotel? I'm like, I absolutely do not think you're running a hotel. Because if you were running a hotel, I would ask to speak to your general manager. 
your tone is completely inappropriate for someone running an entire hotel. And then I would give you a very poor Yelp review. Like a half star, very low rating. Eating is a big thing in our community. Overeating, and people think it's adorable. It's not. My cousin Tony had to get gastric bypass surgery. Do you guys know what that is? That's when you go to the doctor and you're like, Doc, what's the plan? Smaller portions, more exercise? And the doctor's like, we're way past that. We have to remove your stomach. You're too fat to have your own stomach. We tried all those things when you had a stomach and it didn't work because you're not responsible enough to have your own stomach. They took out my cousin's stomach. And my cousin was like, you don't think I could be fat without a stomach? He took it like a challenge. And he took the small stomach that was left and stretched it out into a regular stomach. He really wanted it. I'll tell you what, I have that same mentality because that's the way I was raised. And I spend a lot of my mental energy trying to figure out what to eat and what not to eat. So I went to the doctor, I'm like, doc, can you just remove my stomach? And he said, Mike, you're not fat enough for that. I'm like, Doc, all I really wanted was a compliment. You nailed it. But while not technically funny, I raise a good point with that last joke. How fat do you have to be to get gastric bypass surgery? I would say this, and I am not a physician. All of these surgeries are on YouTube. If you can watch an entire surgery while eating a pizza, I would say you should probably get the surgery. <laughs> we need something for emotional eaters, you know? Like I said before, smokers get all the help. Emotional eaters get no help. This, you millennials need to invent this, a wand. I have the idea, I don't know how to do it. A wand, a wand. You wave it over the food, it tells you the calorie count and then why you're eating it. Wouldn't that be great? Like a donut, 300 calories, and what's this? Your dad didn't love you. That's why there's a hole in the middle of it. That's where his love should have been. You know, last Christmas, my sister got me a $50 gift certificate to Dunkin' Donuts. That's too much money to have at Dunkin' Donuts. Because I walked in there like a god. I'm like, give me five cups of coffee. I dumped two on the ground just to set the tone. Yeah, somebody's part owner of this Dunkin' Donuts. The last time I was in Dunkin' Donuts, I yelled at some kids because they were studying. I was like, you either get your coffee and get out, or you do heroin like everybody else, okay? What do you think this is, a fucking Starbucks? We used to have to eat everything on our plates. My father would scream at me. He's like, you fucking eat everything on your plate. Eat everything on your plate! I'm like, why are you yelling and why is that a rule? Why can't I just put it back? You know what he said? Because people are starving in India. So I overate till I was 18. Then I met somebody from India. And I was like, what the fuck is going on in your country? Do you know that I've been nervously shoveling food into my stupid face for two decades because apparently you guys can't get your shit together? Newsflash, everybody, Indian people have food. It's called Indian food. If they're starving, it's says Indian food is too hot to eat. Have you ever had Indian food? Holy shit. Every once in a while, I take a cab in New York. I always know it's an Indian driver because it's the same song on the radio. And the song sounds like this. <laughs> then I realize that's not a song. That's a guy who just ate Indian food. That's how hot Indian food is. And it's pungent. If you leave Indian food out overnight, the next day, you have to move. That's why Indian people are in this country. They left Indian food out in India. They're like, we have to move to the next town, to the next continent. We need to put an ocean between ourselves and this smell. This smells like somebody's trying to avenge the death of their brother. Indian food. I'm middle-aged, I go to my doctor. He's like, Mike, you need more exercise. I'm like, no, Indian food. He's like, no, you need to sweat and get your heart rate up. I'm like, that's exactly what Indian food does. 
You throw in a touch of diarrhea, you've nailed it completely. Indian food. And when some people hear these jokes, they're like, Mike, are you racist against Indian people? I'm like, absolutely not. I love Indian people, because I live in Queens. And when it's three o'clock in the morning and I need beer, cigarettes, beef jerky, and perhaps a scratch-off ticket, guess who's there for me? I'll give you a hint, it's none of you white motherfuckers. It's an Indian guy. He's there, he's smiling, he's wearing sandals in any kind of weather. Then, after you've had a lifestyle for 20 years, beer, cigarettes, and beef jerky, and you need open heart surgery, guess who walks into the room? Yeah, a fucking nice Dr. Patel. That's what I love about Indians. They tear you down, but then they build you back up again. Indians. This message was brought to you by Indians. <laughs> a couple more minutes, we'll get right into my Pakistani chunk. I'm dating my ex, we go out for Indian food. It was our new favorite food, okay? And it's very weird when you go out for Indian food because it's the hottest food. It must be true, I just told 10 jokes about it. <laughs> but when you're out eating Indian food, they give you the smallest cup for water. It looks like a little metal Monopoly piece. I don't know what that is in their culture. But it's the hottest food, but with the smallest cup. Hottest food, smallest cup, which sounds like a porn that none of us should be watching. <laughs> hottest food, smallest cup. <laughs> So I say to the waiter, I'm like, Haji, please, Haji. That's his name. I'm not being racist. I'm like, Haji, please. Can I use one of my wishes? Because I assume they operate on a magic carpet wish economy. Can I use one of my wishes to get a bigger cup? He's like, Mr. Mike, we do not have a bigger cup. I'm like, wait, Haji, you cannot leave the table with a pitcher of water. You have to keep refilling my Monopoly piece like we're playing some third world drinking game. But he leaves because he has other tables and that's the other thing I love about Indian food. One bite turns you from a man to a menopausal woman. Like, fuck, oh my God, open a window. I think I'm ovulating, call my ob guy. Call my ob guy. And my ex is trying to help. She's like, do you want an acid? I'm like, I think I need a Catholic priest. Because what's happening here does not feel physical. It feels spiritual. Namaste. I go to the bathroom, everybody. When you go to the bathroom after you've eaten Indian food, it feels like you have an STD. I'm peeing, it's burning. I'm thinking to myself, did I just eat dinner or fuck Miley Cyrus? and he's a vegetarian and I don't mind that but he hates me because I eat meat I'm defrosting meat I leave I come home my meat is gone I know he did not eat it it's against their rules he's trying to probably send me like a Liam Neeson type message like I have your son what are you going to do about it and I'm not going to take it I'm not going to take it not from a salad eater which is what I call their people so I wrap my fists in veal punch him in the face yeah, it's called sending a fucking message, all right? He starts bleeding, not blood, some kind of nectar. I don't know what vegetarians have running through their veins. I'm not a Scientologist. I don't practice witchcraft. These vegetarians are a strange group. I dated one, and she was like a hardcore vegetarian. Like, she did not even eat animal crackers. Okay, that's how deep she was in. So I catch her eating chicken. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I know you, that's against the rules. You're not supposed to eat chicken. She's like, it's organic. I'm like, I do not know what that means. She's like, the chicken I'm eating was raised young, natural, and drug-free. Chicken you eat is pumped full of drugs. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know there was a drug war going on in the poultry community. I thought it was keep your kids off drugs, let your chickens do whatever the fuck they want. That's too much responsibility if I'm responsible for myself and my chicken. She's like, the chicken you eat is pumped full of antibiotics. I'm like, that's actually good news because I don't currently have health care. <laughs> so hopefully whatever antibiotics the chicken is on will help cure whatever I have. She's like, the chicken you eat is pumped full of steroids. I'm like, good. 
Good, that means my chicken was competitive. Probably could have beat the shit out of your bitch ass chicken. We didn't have the balls to take what he wanted. But I think it's worse to eat a drug free chicken. And that's what I told her. I'm like, the chicken you're eating was drug free. Trying to live a good life. That chicken was probably like a single mom. Getting her degree online in home health care technician. She's on the way to her book club. She got killed. Now you're chewing on her tits. You're a bad person. Chicken I'm eating was begging to die. He was on drugs. Probably in a biker gang, popping wheelies, going from town to town. Couldn't stop killing prostitutes. Meat eaters, we have our own problems, right? Butcher shops, I don't know how they are out here, but in Queens, it's a little aggressive. I'm walking with my nephew, he's 10. We come upon a butcher shop. It says butcher. I can read it, he can read it, we both can read it. Is there any reason for there to be a goat skin hanging upside down in the window? <laughs> now I gotta answer his questions. Uncle Mike, why is there a goat skin hanging upside down in the window? I'm like, well, obviously, Nicholas, this goat was a snitch. <laughs> you keep your mouth shut on the streets, you know? He's like, what about the pig next to him? I'm like, probably wrong place, wrong time. You know? I like boxing a great deal. There are any Yay. boxing fans here? So you're into it? Okay, okay, this might, because it's very hard to talk boxing with anybody unless you know Spanish, because like white and black people don't care about boxing. Spanish people like boxing, Mexican, okay. So I like boxing as a sport, and I tried it, but I'm very bad at boxing because I get punched in the face a lot. I have no head movement. But it's okay because there's rounds, and in between rounds, you go and talk to your coach, and he gives you advice about how to do better. It's like having a father. It's pretty sweet. And my coach, he should have been giving me advice like, you should go back to school. You should never do this again. This is terrible for you. But he was really good. He's like, Mike, that guy is pumping his jab pretty regularly into your face. <laughs> now when he does that, you need to strategize on how to counter punch. I'm like, yeah, but coach, he's punching me in the place where I'm thinking of my strategy. <laughs> and that throws me off a lot. So he says, Mike, you're better at shadow boxing. And for those of you guys not in the fight game, shadow boxing is when there's a pretend person in front of you and you're fighting that pretend person. And I do a great job with that, everybody. <laughs> because I have a fantastic imagination. My mother told me that when I was young. She's like, Michael, you're gonna surprise a lot of people with your imagination when you're older. And it's really true, because I was doing such a great job throwing combinations, so much so my coach was like, Mike, I have to run an errand. I'll be back in 10 minutes, keep shadow boxing. And I was doing great. He comes back, I'm on the rowing machine. And he confronts me, he's like, Mike, I thought I told you to shadow box. I'm like, coach, you did, but I knocked that guy out. <laughs> and now I've stolen his boat. I don't think you were prepared for my level of imagination, because I fantasize it all the way out to complete victory. <laughs> Who's my favorite boxer? George Foreman. Yes, a lot of people argue with me. They're like, Tyson, Ali, I'm like, Foreman, because Foreman was fat through his entire career. <laughs> Do you know how many calories you shed during a boxing workout? So many. And to remain fat through your entire career is nothing short of amazing. He even invented a grill where he's like, I want all of you guys to be fat also, you know? I root for the fat boxer. Even if they don't win, it doesn't matter because they're fighting for a belt and the fat boxer doesn't need a belt because his pants stay up because he's fat. <laughs> I go to hot yoga and uh, I complain about it being too hot because it is too hot. I go to hot yoga and my friends are like, why don't you just go to regular yoga? I'm like, I like hot yoga. I like hot yoga because you're sweating so much, no one can tell that you're crying. They're like, Mike, are you chanting? I'm like, I'm weeping which is a form of chanting in the West. I like carrying a small mat around with me. I like carrying a small mat, because my friends are dumb. They're like, are you going to yoga? I'm like, this? No. I like to engage people in tiny wrestling matches all over the city. There's a problem, I roll out the mat, I wave on the challenge. 
Come on, bitch. Let's solve it in this one by two by one by two inch space. I think hot yoga is just a way to get you to buy coconut water. Coconut water is $13 a box. Oddly, it comes in boxes. You need it to rehydrate. Do I really need to rehydrate? Maybe you turn the heat down so I'm not sweating every liquid I have in my body out onto a tiny mat. The lady is very mean to me in hot yoga because I am not flexible, but that's why I'm there. I'm there to take myself out of my comfort zone. That's how you grow. But she just is mean and she's dressed in a bathing suit. She's like a sexy Hitler. She's like, pick up your foot. Pick up your foot! I'm like, do you just think I'm being non-compliant? Like I'm trying to be the bad boy of the yoga class? I obviously cannot pick up my foot the way that you want me to pick up my foot. I picked up my foot, but I fell forward. I fell right into the ass of the woman in front of me. Yeah, I fell right into her ass chakra. Threw off the energy of the room. They kicked me out. I didn't want to be there anyway. It was too hot. Then the woman at the desk is going to give me shit. She's like, your credit card didn't go through. You need to pay cash. I'm like, I don't have any cash on me. I'll have to get you the next time. She's like, no, it must be solved by the end of the business day. I'm like, now who's not being flexible? I complain about it being too hot. You know what the instructor says? The seasons are changing and we kind of have to adjust to the seasons. I'm like, do you know how buildings work? Because you control the weather on the inside of a building. That's why it's different from the outside of a building. Otherwise, you would not need buildings. She's like, don't you feel better after it's over? I'm like, I feel better the way that someone feels better after they've survived a car accident. I feel better that I'm alive but I don't feel better than if I never would have come here. She's like, but you're losing weight. Aren't you happy you're losing weight? I'm like, am I losing weight? I don't feel like I'm losing weight. I feel like I'm evaporating. I feel like that's happening. I feel like there's a fucking cloud outside that looks exactly like me. Fat, white, and sad. Edible arrangements. Some of you look puzzled. Edible arrangements is fruit that looks like flowers and lets it sit on your porch for a day. Then it's fruit that looks like rotten fruit. <laughs> My friend sent me edible arrangements. He's like, what do you think? I'm like, I'm offended. Because it's like saying, look, I would have sent you flowers, but I was afraid you would eat them. <laughs> what I'm saying is I think you're too stupid for flowers. The worst part of edible arrangements, it's fruit that looks like flowers. Half of it is covered in chocolate. Yes. Yeah, do you understand the problem with that though? Fruit is already sweet compliments of Jesus. You don't need synthetic sweetness on top of it. Man-made synthetic sweetness. It's like if I'm looking at a sunset and I'm like, you know what would make this sunset a lot better? If I was on heroin. <laughs> I dated a millennial. She was younger, but she used to text everything. She used to text everything and some things she shouldn't text. One time she texted me something very serious. She texted me, when was my last period? So I text back, do we have a problem slash blessing? Because I'm not a millennial, but I'm not stupid. She texts me back, fuck you. I'm like, okay, sweetie, I don't want to ask a millennial if she's pregnant. Let me try again. Then I text back, did my sperm photobomb your ultrasound? LOL, OMG, smiley face emoji, smiley face, winky face, taco. Awesome. I was in a long relationship and we had to make sex interesting. I don't know how you guys do it, but we used to have sex to the show Law and Order. Okay? We'd start having sex, we'd turn the show on. Every time the show would go dun dun, we'd switch positions. It's almost like we were part of the investigation. Searching for justice in all of our holes. Penis size. <laughs> Ladies, does it matter? Ladies, I f I'm fucking talking to you. Does it matter? 
Because I don't have a gigantic penis. This is how I describe it online, okay? If penises were flashlights with my penis in a dark room, ladies, you would be able to see. You would not be able to read, but you would be able to see, and that's pretty helpful. <laughs> Did any lady recently give their man a car blowjob? A blowjob in the car. Did that happen over here? Yes! Fucking nailed it. Great job. Dude, I wish I could raffle something off. Car blowjobs. Is that like a thing from the 70s? It doesn't happen anymore, ladies. You're a guy who says safety first. That's what I like. He didn't turn down the blowjob. He just drove more carefully. <laughs> Fucking great dude. What's that? <laughs> Is that your lady there? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> right. Way to protect the innocent. By round of applause, guys. Do you enjoy a car blowjob? Okay. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> I think there's a registered sex offender in the back. Yeah! Fuck yeah, Ozzy! <laughs> Ladies, question for you. Ladies, question for you. Do you enjoy giving car blowjobs? Clap. I don't see what the fucking problem is. This should be a major thing on the road. That's only like three women clapping, by the way. Here's how arrogant my ex was. She didn't even ask me if I wanted one. She just went down there and started unbuckling my pants. And I'm not going to fucking protest because I don't want to fight for three days about why I don't like her blowjobs. So I take my pants down. She's doing it. She's into it. And it's like you have to be very careful because that's if you get into an accident and one if she dies in an accident, you have to explain that to her parents. Here's what you didn't know about your daughter. Love to suck dick on the road. Did not care for traffic laws. Enjoyed sucking dick on the road. That's an awkward conversation to have, you know? I don't even like it that much. I'll be honest with you. I like the novelty of it. I don't care for it that much, you know, because I'm not going to come. And if I'm not going to come, it just feels like my dick is in warm water. And that's not bad, but I don't need to be doing that on a six-lane highway. This is what I do, you know? She's doing it, I, um, I tap the brakes. Oh, no. Think about what happens when you tap the brakes. Let me, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just say it. My penis was going to the back of her throat and she was choking a little bit. This served two purposes, okay? One, it taught her about the dangers of distracted driving. And two, and most importantly, it made me feel big. I could feel really big on the road. Yeah. Penis, not big in real life. Going 60 miles an hour? Yeah. Different fucking story. Different ball game, ladies and gentlemen. I got into a fight with a British guy on behalf of my gay friend because he said the word fag. I guess it means something different over there. I'm like, bro, you cannot say the word fag. He's like, I was asking for a cigarette. I'm like, yeah, but you said, can I have a cigarette, you fag? <laughs> My best friend in high school turned out to be gay, and I should have known, because one day we were talking, he's like, what's worse, to look gay in a straight jacket or straight in a gay jacket? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure, but we should probably get out of this closet. We're just in a closet, jerking each other off like men. I'm pro-women. Can I say that first? Ladies, I'm, I'm pro-you. I'm pro-women. Okay. You could tell how women... No, you could tell... Let me start again. I'm pro-woman. But you can tell how women have changed with secret antiperspirant, okay? Because the motto used to be, secret, strong enough for a man, but made for a woman. 
Then it was secret, strong enough for a woman. Now it's secret, all sex is rape. <laughs> All of these will make the CD, everybody. <laughs> Healthcare, let's talk about it. Do you know if any of us needed an ambulance right now, it will cost nine to $1,100 to get to the hospital. That's true. That's not for the hospital visit. That's for the ride to the hospital. But if we called an Uber, it would be seven to $12. And the driver of the Uber is probably a doctor in Pakistan. I'm single, and uh, I have a series of related people are like, Mike, why are you single? You're um, obviously very smart and good looking. And uh, thank you, that wasn't one of the jokes that I was telling. That wasn't one of the jokes. I just had relationships that did not work. And I'll tell you what, ladies, you're not the only one, if you get dumped, that feels down. I get dumped, I'm very emotional. I go right into the gutter, you know? And I don't have money for therapy. The last one who dumped me, this is what I did to feel better about myself. I have a GPS in my phone, GPS in my car, I'd set them both to the female voice. i put in different destinations, then I would just drive. It felt like two women were fighting over me. Empowering, very empowering. The last one I dated, I broke up with her because it was too much fighting. You ever have that? Where you love somebody, but it's too much fighting. And I told her, I'm like, sweetie, I'm already fighting the world. I cannot fight the world and then come home and fight you. I have no time to rest. It's like being in a boxing match. You're punching your opponent, your opponent's punching you, but then the bell rings and you go back to your corner, but then your trainer starts punching you. Because he thought you were looking at a ring girl for too long. She suffered from seasonal depression. You know who doesn't want to hear about seasonal depression? People who were alive during the Great Depression. Because I told my grandfather, I'm like, Grandpa, you're going to meet my girlfriend. You guys have so much in common. You almost died because you didn't have any bread. And she gets really sad when it's cloudy out. You guys are like twins. We got into huge fights because at the time I did not believe seasonal depression was real. And she was like, you don't think it's real? I'm like, no, I don't. I don't think any disease is real that you can cure by moving to Florida. I'm like, if it is a real disease, what are the symptoms? She's like, anger, irritability, not being able to get along with others. I'm like, wow, that sounds a lot like being a bitch. That sounds eerily similar to being a bitch. She did compliment me though. She's like, Mike, you're very smart. I'm like, let me correct you. I'm thoughtful. But not thoughtful in the sense that if you mention you like a piece of jewelry, I'll buy it and surprise you on your birthday. I'm thoughtful in the sense that if you tell me you have seasonal depression, I can write a lot of jokes about it. I'm the worst kind of thoughtful. We had great makeup sex though. You ever have that? She's like, do you want to choke me? Anything you want, do you want to choke me during sex? I'm like, sex is actually the only time I don't want to choke you. It's the rest of the time when you're running your goddamn mouth. How about you try shutting your... Relationships are tricky. I think that's my point. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Can I say something positive about her? Because I feel like I'm shitting on her a lot right now, okay? Comedians are very hard to date, okay? Because relationships are about what? Vulnerability. And as a comic, I'm just always kind of looking for the joke. And women don't like that. That's what I've learned. We're opening up. She's like, my last three boyfriends, EMS worker, firefighter, then I dated a police officer. And I was like, wow, your pussy's like a civil service exam. <laughs> Pretty funny. Pretty funny, right? Pretty solid. Pretty funny. You know what she says to me? That's not funny. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I can see why you don't think that's funny. But if you take yourself out of it emotionally and just look at joke structure, I fucking nailed it. Very solid joke, you know? Thank you.
she shaved a landing strip in her area, which I appreciate because I travel a lot. So one time we're having drunk sex, and I'm usually good because I work my core, good cardio, you know? But I cannot finish in this particular situation. So um, I take a knee, and i um, gathering my thoughts and my breath, and I start resting my masculinity on her landing strip. Finally, she's like, what the fuck is taking so long? I'm like, I'm very sorry, but it's a layover. We will be taking off again shortly. Thank you so much for your patience. I know you have a choice when it comes to intercourse. Thank you for choosing me. I'm doing online dating. The girl that I've been stalking on Christian Mingle has filed a restraining order against me. And she was like, you have to stay 50 feet away. And I was like, I will not stay 50 feet away from God's match for me. <laughs> Your God's match. Man's law will not get in the way of God's match. I wish Christian Mingle was on your phone, like Tinder, but you wouldn't swipe left to reject. You would swipe down, so it's like you're rejecting her and sending her to hell at the same time. Women in New York online, they're very beautiful, but they're also very high maintenance to the point where I don't even look at the woman anymore. She's usually in a picture with a guy. I assume that's an ex-boyfriend. I look at him. I look to see how tired he is. If that guy looks exhausted, I just move forward. <laughs> Women love to ski. That's also what I've learned about online dating. Women in New York, you know? Women love to ski. And the reason I know that is because the woman has five pictures of herself in a ski outfit from head to toe. And the problem with that, ladies, is I do not know what you look like. You could just tell me you like to ski. I don't have to have five of the same picture from head to toe. Now I have to send you an awkward message. If we're skiing and there's an avalanche and I have to eat your body, after I eat your body, will I be full, a little hungry, or very hungry? Because I don't know what you look like. We still haven't gotten into my IHOP chunk yet. Yes, IHOP. I know there's one right on the corner here. And I will be there. That's where the after party is. We're very close to the IHOP. Does that make you feel safe? It makes me feel safe. It used to be a gym? That's pretty ironic. <laughs> Fat people are still going there. Dating now, this is how I date. I don't go out for dates anymore. What I do is I meet women for coffee. That's what I do now for dating. I meet women for coffee. And I meet the women that I date at the IHOP, the International House of Pancakes. Not on a first date. The IHOP is usually a third date for me. I usually go Waffle House, Denny's, IHOP to see if it's real, you know? I'm not gonna take you right to an IHOP, ladies. All right, you're gonna have to earn it a little bit. I go to the IHOP, I'm waiting for my date. Waitress comes over. I believe her to be my waitress, I'm not sure. She's wearing khakis, I'm assuming she's my waitress. She puts an entire pot of coffee on the table. I'm one person. They do not give a fuck at the IHOP. She puts an entire pot of coffee on the table like she expects me to solve a cold case murder. Then she disappears into the kitchen. My waitress had a teardrop tattoo. Do you guys know what that means? It means she killed somebody, probably with the food that she's been serving, because IHOP is terrible food. We we're done eating. She's like, did you save room for dessert? I'm like, everything on the fucking menu is dessert. We we're just calling it breakfast. This place is a lie. Pancakes with whipped cream is cake. I'm sitting by myself with a pot of coffee. You ever drink a pot of coffee by yourself? You ever drink an entire pot of coffee by yourself? Holy shit. You go through a roller coaster of emotions. One cup, you're like, I feel good. Two cups, you're like, I fucking feel great. 
Three cups. You're like, I'm going to call the girl I dated in 10th grade. I'm going to give her a ring. I'm just going to feel her out. Four cups, you drop back down. You're like, nobody cares about me. Nobody even liked my last Instagram post. Five cups, you come back up. You're like, I think I could be a bounty hunter. I think I could be some kind of a rogue law enforcement agent. I look for the kitchen because my waitress, I haven't seen her in about four years, okay? There's a sign above the kitchen that says all the baking is done on the premises. And I figured all the baking was done on the premises, you know? But now there's a gigantic sign proclaiming that all the baking is done on the premises. You know what I'm starting to suspect? A lot of the baking is not done on the premises. It's probably done in a secret location. I'm thinking this out because of the coffee, you know? The woman I'm waiting for, for the date, comes in, sits down, we get right to it. That's what I love about this age, we get right to it. She's like, I'm a Christian, is that a problem? I'm like, absolutely not, I've been stalking you on Christian Mabel. She's like, I have 12 cats, is that an issue? I'm like, it's not an issue, I just don't understand why you would have 12 cats. You're a Christian, are they your disciples? Will one of them betray you before the meal is over? She's like, that's why I don't tell people I have 12 cats. People judge me. My cats never judge me. I'm like, that's ironic because you have a jury of cats. 12 cats is an entire jury. I'm sorry if I offend anybody, but cats are very judgmental. My ex had a cat. Okay, and the cat, when I was over her apartment, used to watch me shower. It would sit on the corner of the tub and watch me shower, just staring. And I felt very judged. Because I know that cat has seen everybody she's dated in the past. And that cat was looking at me like, I do not get what she sees in you. Maybe you have a really nice car. I don't know, I'm not allowed outside. This inner cat monologue. It's not working out with the cat lady, everybody. I look past her, there's a woman breastfeeding. There's a woman breastfeeding in the IHOP. Now ladies, you're not gonna find a man more supportive of breastfeeding in public than yours truly. Just not in a restaurant. Because I feel like you've opened up a smaller restaurant inside that larger restaurant. I'm complimenting you, your bodies are restaurants, you're amazing. I just don't think, you know, not in the IHOP. At the very least, I feel like it's an outside beverage. Take it outside. There's no outside beverages allowed in the IHOP. You know what women who are breastfeeding in public really hate? Eye contact and photography. They don't like either of those two things. She's like, I'm trying to raise my child. I'm like, I'm trying to build an Instagram following. Both of us have dreams. Your dream is not better than my dream. I go to the bathroom. And where I live, on the IHOP bathroom, there's a punch code on the door. There's a punch code on the door to the IHOP bathroom, which doesn't make sense, because they're serving you food that's gonna guarantee that you shit your pants. <laughs> then they're putting an Ocean's Eleven type contraption between you and the toilet. So it's like, am I gonna make it? Am I not gonna make it? Stay tuned. You're in your own little action adventure movie. Let's say for the sake of the story, I make it. What's right in my face as I get in there? Baby changing station. Baby changing station. And I don't have kids, so I do what? Cocaine off the baby changing station because I don't have to be up early. There's a sign above the baby changing station that says, do not leave your child unattended. And I'm like, for them to put a sign there, are people leaving their babies in the IHOP bathroom? Who in the fuck would leave their baby in an IHOP bathroom? Then I peek out, look at the dining room. Like, every one of these people looks like they would leave their baby in an IHOP bathroom. Every one of these motherfuckers looks like they cannot wait to leave their baby in an IHOP bathroom. So I go back in, and I'm washing my hands, you know? And there's a man grunting in the handicapable stall. I don't know what that's about. Did he have a bad meal, or is he in there doing CrossFit? I don't know, but it's the perfect place to do CrossFit if you do not have a CrossFit membership, because there's a lot of space and bars. I go to dry my hands, and the hand dryer in the IHOP is very weak, everybody. It's almost like it's whispering a secret to your hands. And that secret is, you're gonna have to dry your hands on your shirt, because I'm not gonna do my fucking job as a hand dryer. 
I leave the bathroom, I go to pay my bill, but you don't pay the waitress in the IHOP because she's in a gang. You pay the hostess. And I go to pay with a $100 bill, and she says, we do not accept 50 or $100 bills. And I'm like, why don't I come back when your business is more successful? Are you saying that I have more money than the IHOP? So I pay with a card, but I don't have a swipe card, I have a chip card, it's new. And with a chip card, you just have to jam it into the bottom of the machine. So I jam it really hard into the bottom of the machine. My date didn't go well. I haven't gotten laid in a while. So I jam it really hard to the bottom of the machine. Then the machine says processing. Then the machine says do not pull out. And everything inside of me is saying, you better fucking pull out, Michael. My father's voice is in my head saying, Michael, you better pull out. You cannot afford to have a baby in the IHOP. If I do, I'll leave him right in the bathroom. I don't give a fuck about any sign. I'll leave a baby right in that IHOP bathroom. So I pull my card out. I tap the top of the machine. I'm like, you like that? Huh? You're dirty, right? You're a fucking dirty little restaurant. A dirty restaurant? You dirty restaurant? My point is, don't eat IHOP. It's terrible food. It's not good food. I was sitting waiting for my date, and I noticed they have syrups that do not exist in nature. Maple, blueberry, walnut? That's not a tree. That was made in a lab. That should be called diabetes in a jar. Because if you eat it, you will have to amputate your own foot on the baby changing station in the bathroom of the restaurant. That's why the restaurant is called the IHOP, everybody. Because you walk in, but you have to limp out. You guys are fantastic. I love you guys. Thank you.